For a long time, I've had an interest in making an emulation handheld with the look and feel of a classic console. Many of these DIY projects, however, required extensive shell modding and a liberal use of hot glue. Because of the DIY nature and extensive modding required, I pushed off doing a build of my own for several years. However, when UK-based circuit board designer Kite created an all-in-one DIY kit and BoxyPixel made a shell for it, I knew I had to jump in and finally build my very own emulation handheld. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tito and welcome to another episode of Retro Renew. Today we're going to build an emulation handheld that is taking me probably nearly one year to acquire all the parts for. It also cost me an arm and a leg, which makes me queasy just thinking about it. I'll be going over the cost later in the video. Now at the center of this build is the Circuit Sword AIO, or All-in-One PCB. It comes with all the electronics you need minus the battery. It was designed and developed by a guy named Kite Retro, who's based out of the UK. Unfortunately, this kit is not readily available for purchase. To buy one, you need to participate in a group buy pre-order, which occurs about once a year. Fortunately, if you're watching this video before February 27th, 2021, you can actually get on the pre-order list for Kite's next group buy. So if you think this is something you're interested in, I highly recommend signing up as soon as possible. I'll have a link to his pre-order website down below. Now this kit was designed to fit inside a regular DMG shell, as you can tell by its shape. However, BoxyPixel has made his very own custom DMG styled machine aluminum shell that makes the installation of this kit almost drop in. It's incredible. With these two products and a few other components, I hope to make the emulation handheld that I've always wanted. All right, as usual, I'll start off by briefly going over everything I'll be using in this build. Then I'll show you how to put it all together and lastly, I'll briefly discuss the key features of the console, go over the pros and cons, and of course, provide you with my overall thoughts. So starting with all the components I'm using for this build, I'll first go over Kite's Circuit Sword All-in-One Kit, followed by the contents of BoxyPixel Shell, and then I'll go over all the miscellaneous items you need to finish the job. So the first thing, and arguably the most important part of the Circuit Sword Kit is the All-in-One, or AIO, PCB. This is what ties all the electronics together and is an amazing feat in design. Additionally, the Circuit Sword kit comes with the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 3, a 320x240 LCD, the backboard which is used for USB and HDMI output, the power switch board to safely turn the system on and off, an 8 ohm 2 watt speaker, a second backboard for the L and R triggers, which we actually won't be using since it's not compatible with the BoxyPixel shell, all the necessary connecting wires and cables, a cooling fan, and a momentary switch. Now, I have to admit, this is actually a clone circuit sword kit, which I do not recommend buying at all. It actually cost me $80 more than the real thing, and it doesn't come with the amazing customer service that Kite offers. The only reason why I bought it was because I wanted to complete this video, and I wasn't sure when Kite would open another group buy. The last group buy was about a year ago, so definitely jump on the current pre-order going on right now, since he won't be actually making these anymore. I went ahead and placed my order in case I wanted to build another. Great, so next is the BoxyPixel aluminum shell. This kit comes in three primary pieces. Here we have the front shell, which as you can see looks very similar to the DMG, but you can obviously see some differences. Here we have cutouts for two additional buttons, an opening for an analog stick, and some holes for the LED indicator lights. Next we have the rear shell. This also has some really neat tricks up its sleeve. The BoxyPixel logo here serves as an air inlet, and this opening here is the exhaust to whisk away heat from the Raspberry Pi CPU. So yes, this is actually an actively cooled system. Looking inside, we see a beefy heatsink, which is tied to the whole rear shell. Totally awesome, and I'm sure it does wonders to keep the CPU running nice and cool. 
And the last part of the shell is the battery cover, which doubles as the housing for the LNR triggers. Additionally, the boxy pixel shell comes with a set of screws and this really nice 3D printed bracket that perfectly secures the battery we'll be using. This brings me to all the other miscellaneous things you'll need to complete the build. The first is the battery. This is the Mega Battery 4.5 from Helder. Boxypixel designed his shell to fit this specific battery. Next is the button backboard from Hulihu, which gives us L and R triggers and is compatible again with the Boxypixel shell. Note you'll need to use small washers to install it. Next you'll need a DMG D-pad and two sets of action buttons for a total of four. I have brass boxy pixel buttons here, but regular plastic ones will work as well. And of course, you'll need the DMG membranes to go with the buttons. And don't forget the power switch. Speaking of buttons, you'll need Nintendo DS Lite buttons, which will be used as the L and R triggers, which will become clear during the installation. You'll also have to get a DMG styled screen lens, which has a thin border, some thermal paste, a micro SD card, and an analog stick. This is from a PlayStation Vita model PCH2000. Okay, I think I covered everything. Now you can see why it took me so long to acquire this laundry list of parts. So without any further ado, let's put this thing together. For this tutorial, we'll start with the power switch. We need to solder the momentary switch to the through holes shown here. Make sure the switch lays flat against the PCB. Once completed, we'll move our attention to the rear trigger PCB. We simply need to solder all four buttons in place. And this is what it should look like. Next, grab the HDMI backboard PCB, power switch, and cables. Connect all the cables to the HDMI backboard as shown. When plugging in the ribbon cable, make sure the blue side is facing up. And then connect the bottom cable, which is for the R triggers. And this is what the fully assembled backboard should look like. Now insert the Raspberry Pi module into the motherboard. It's keyed, so it should only go in one way. Now you can attach the HDMI backboard to the motherboard. Again, make sure the blue tab is facing up. Now we're gonna solder the LNR trigger wires to the trigger PCB. If you look at the silkscreen lettering near the wire connector on the HDMI backboard, it will tell you what each wire is for, and you just need to match it up to the trigger PCB solder pads. The last thing you need to solder is the fan. Solder the red wire to the pad label fan positive, and the black wire to the pad labeled fan negative. And then cover the Wi-Fi module with some Kapton tape. Now let's install the circuit sword into the boxy pixel shell. Grab the rear shell and drop in one of the buttons that came with the Hooli Hoo trigger PCB kit. It fits in perfectly. Next, position the power switch and fasten it in place with two screws. Don't forget to install the switch cover. 
it may be a good idea to tape it in place so it doesn't move around. Next, position the HDMI PCB onto the rear shell as shown. And then secure it in place with two machine screws. Next, apply the absolute perfect amount of thermal paste. That looks about perfect. Now carefully drop in the fan with the vent facing down while also positioning the motherboard appropriately into place. Once in position, secure the motherboard with three screws, one on top, one on the left, and one on the right. Now grab the front shell housing. Position the analog stick so it aligns with the screw holes and then fasten it in place. I put some foam backing behind the analog stick for additional support. Next, install the buttons and membranes. Make sure the membranes are properly seated. Remove the protective film on the LCD and drop it in place with the ribbon cable on top. Now carefully insert the LCD ribbon cable into the motherboard as shown. Then carefully close the two halves together, paying attention to the power switch cover. You may want to tape it in place so that it doesn't fall out during this step. And then secure the two halves with four screws. Next, grab the battery cover and install the four DS Lite buttons. Then position the trigger PCB onto the battery cover. Because I'm using washers that are too big for my screws, I need to offset them so the screws can clamp down on the PCB. I then added hot glue to ensure the washers don't move out of place. If you use the correct size washers, you don't need to worry about this step. Next, carefully position the speaker into its cubby, and then plug it in as shown. With the speaker wires tucked away, go ahead and position the battery caddy. Once in place, secure it with a single screw. Then plug in the battery, making sure the polarity is correct. Go ahead and set the battery in place. Now carefully close the battery door. And secure it with the three shorter machine screws. Flip the console over. And then install the glass screen lens. Peel the protective film, and you're done. This is an astonishing piece of kit. I've built one other RetroPie console in the past, but this thing just blows it out of the water. This is a chunky beast that weighs in at over 500 grams. That's over a pound. The way Kite's Circuit Sword integrates into Boxy Pixel Shell is almost like putting together a Lego set. Well, not exactly. But minus the small amount of soldering, this was an easy and frankly very fun build. I would say that the soldering required is fairly simple. The hardest part was juggling the web of components as I placed it into the shell. Other than that, it's a fantastic and fun project to build. So let's go over some of the unique features of this kit. At the end of the day, this is essentially a RetroPie gaming handheld. So it has all the same features that you would find in a RetroPie 4.4 device. So I won't be going over the features of RetroPie or Emulation Station in this video. Instead, there are a few neat features within the Circuit Sword PCB and the firmware that integrates the entire package together quite nicely, and that's what I'll be going over. The first unique feature is this mode button here on the back. 
by pressing and holding the mode button, an on-screen display appears which has quite a bit of functionality. First on the list is volume. You can make adjustments by tapping up or down on the D-pad. Then there is brightness control. You can make adjustments by tapping left or right on the D-pad. Wi-Fi is also controlled here and can be toggled on or off by pressing either A or B. And you can toggle the mute function of the speaker by pressing X or Y. If you have an analog stick connected, you can turn it on or off by pressing the left or right trigger. And lastly is the on-screen keyboard, which can be activated by pressing start and deactivated by pressing select. This is really useful when adjusting some of the settings and configuration of RetroPie without the need of a physical external keyboard. The mode button also allows you to monitor the voltage and CPU temperature, which is a really nice touch. After running some Nintendo 64 games for a while, I noticed that temperatures did not exceed 39 degrees Celsius, which I think is a testament to the heat dissipation capabilities of the boxy pixel shell. So as you can see, the little mode button packs quite a punch in terms of features. Additionally, the boxy pixel shell allows for four trigger buttons in the rear, which is awesome, and increases the console's versatility in terms of additional inputs for more varieties of emulators. Another great feature is the built-in Wi-Fi. Having Wi-Fi allows you to easily transfer ROMs onto the system. You can simply transfer ROMs using an FTP application, such as WinSCP. After I got it set up, transferring ROMs was a breeze. However, getting to that point was a real challenge for me, but I'll get into that later in the video. Kite Circuit Sword also features HDMI out, which works pretty well. I'm not sure I'll use this feature much, as this is more of an on-the-go console for me, but I'm glad Kite included it as a feature anyway. Now, I won't go too much into the Raspberry Pi's capabilities since it's pretty well documented, but I found that it played games all the way up to the original PlayStation really well. Here's a couple shots of gameplay for a few consoles. Everything I played pretty much worked flawlessly, with the exception of the Nintendo 64. I noticed some crackling and issues with audio, as well as some frame rate issues, but for the most part, I'd say it's still quite playable. The fact that it can play PS1 games is really awesome. I love the PlayStation library, and I think that it's great that it can be played on this system. I'm currently trying to figure out how to add Saturn and Dreamcast emulators to RetroPie, and I'd be thrilled if those worked as well. Now, I could do a whole video on the features of this kit, but I think I covered all the major ones. For the sake of time, let's get into the pros and cons. Starting with the pros, as with all BoxyPixel products, the shell is absolutely phenomenal. This shell is key to what makes the build so easy. It's expertly crafted, and the integrated heatsink is awesome. The LNR triggers and analog stick integration is another pro of the BoxyPixel shell. This expands the handheld's compatibility with many different emulators. While I don't have the analog stick wired up at the moment, I have the parts on order to hook it up in the near future. Listening through the headphones was an excellent experience. The audio is crystal clear, and I'm super impressed at the quality of the output. It was not something I was expecting. And the last pro is just how everything is super well integrated. When put together, to me, this is an extremely polished product. While it does have some rough edges, overall, if you want a relatively simple emulation build, this is the way to go. Okay. On to the cons. I have to say, in my short time with the console, I don't have too many cons. The build was a fairly straightforward process, and the end result is fantastic. Now, the biggest problem, and funny enough, the thing that took me the longest, even longer than building the console, was trying to figure out how to get the ROMs on the SD card. From what I could tell, the best way to do that is to use a file transfer protocol or FTP client to wirelessly copy the ROM files to the SD card. I won't go over that process in this video, but if it's something you guys are interested in seeing a tutorial on, let me know in the comments section below. Another small issue I found is that the screen lens border seems to be covering some of the LCD. Now, this really isn't the fault of the shell since I could purchase a non-silk screen lens and that would probably take care of most of the issue. The next con is availability of parts and the price. Both the BoxyPixel shell, which is currently sold out, 
and Kite Circuit Sword, which is currently on pre-order, are not the easiest components to procure. Additionally, they are expensive. With the BoxyPixel shell coming in at $120 when I bought it about a year ago, and the Circuit Sword kit costing 120 British pounds. All in all, with all the extra components I procured for this build, I spent over $350 on this project. Definitely not cheap. And the last issue, in my opinion, are the ergonomics. Now, you have to understand, this was first and foremost intended to be modeled after the DMG, which I love. However, the DMG form factor isn't the best platform when you're adding more modern controls, such as triggers, and an analog stick. Speaking of which, the location of the analog stick is sort of in a weird position. While I haven't tried it yet since I don't have it hooked up, I can already tell that it will feel a bit awkward to play on. Which brings me to the LNR triggers. While playing one of my favorite games, Resident Evil on the original PlayStation, I found that trying to use the triggers was a bit awkward and slightly uncomfortable. It's not too huge of a deal, and I think if I remap the L1 and R1 to the inner trigger buttons, it will make gameplay a bit more comfortable. And lastly, this thing is heavy. It weighs in at over 500 grams, which is over one pound. I can see that extended gameplay sessions could lead to a bit of fatigue, but I can appreciate the weight as it feels super solid and high quality. So with this build, I think it's form over function, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. This kit and the shell were specifically designed with the DMG aesthetic in mind, and I think within the design constraints, both Kite and BoxyPixel pulled off one of the best looking emulation handhelds in my opinion. So there you have it, the Circuit Sword DMG CM3 emulation handheld, an incredible way to enjoy generations of video games in a small yet hefty package. As always, I'm curious about what you think of this build, so definitely leave me a comment down below. I hope you did enjoy this video. If you did, please give it a like and consider subscribing to the channel. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Macho Nacho Productions. I release content every Thursday, so be sure to turn on notifications. And as always, see you next time.